Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, OBS, which is the software that I use to record everything, just decided to uh, to crash. So sorry about that. Um, okay, so where was I? Um, you'll uh, you'll be able to save everything online on Scratch, and um, that will uh, you don't have to download anything. Now you can actually, if you want. Uh, you can download a um, offline version uh, for various uh, devices, and that will allow you to work on things when you're not connected to the internet. And there's a pretty easy way to upload and download things. So if you've got spotty internet connection, this might be handy. Um, but if you're wherever you are has pretty reliable internet, then uh, then you don't really need to worry about that. So. Okay, so we'll go back to the main page, and um, if you click on your username and see my stuff, uh, it'll show you all of the projects that you have. And obviously, I have a whole bunch of them here um, because I've been teaching this class a lot before. So, um, so we'll just kind of dive right in, and so I'm going to create a new project, and when you do that, it will. Um, You'll load up with a essentially blank project that looks something like this, and uh, nothing real fancy. And uh, so let's kind of look at what we have at our uh, disposal here. So um, the uh, um, you'll have uh, on the left side of the screen under the code um, tab. Uh, you have different categories of code blocks, and they're sorted into, you know, categories based on what they do. So motion, look, sound, events, control, sensing, operators, variables, and then my blocks, which is advanced, we'll talk about later. Um, so in Scratch, uh, everything that you see uh, is called a sprite. And a sprite just means it's an object that has some sort of visual to go with it, although it could be hidden. Um, so for example, here we have this little cat. And the cat has no code associated with it. That code would go kind of in the middle of the screen, um, the, the big white space in the middle of the screen. Um, and then on the right, uh, the sort of top right part of the screen, you'll see basically a preview as to what your program would look like. So Scratch is really built around making simple animations or simple kind of 2D video games. Um, and the code for it is all going to be sort of graphical uh, stuff on the left. So um, basically everything starts with an event, which for the purposes of us starting will be when green flag is clicked. So if I dr click and drag the when green flag is clicked over to the middle of the um, middle of the screen, then uh, anything that follows after this will be executed step by step by step um, after I click the green flag, which is basically start the program. So for example, I can make my cat move. I can make him move 10 steps and then if I execute that, then it moved ever so slightly to the right. Um, and now I'll drag the cat. So I just clicked on the cat and dragged him to the left half part of the screen. Um, so if I do that, then I can, um, if I click on the green flag thing in my program, it will execute it. Or I can click the green flag up in the top. Uh, now, you probably noticed that the green flag and the red stop sign kind of flickered when I did that, and that's because our program right now really only has one instruction to move the cat 10 steps, and then it immediately terminates. Um, and that's, that's it. Uh, so we can make this a little bit more exotic and start to add more steps to the program. Uh, so, for example, we could make it... Um, I'm going to go to control and put a wait one second, and then I'm going to right click and duplicate. And so I could make it do a particular action multiple times. Um, okay. 
So everybody's still with me. Uh, it's like, can somebody say something in Discord just so I'm sure we, I'm still with everybody? Barely. What do you mean barely? Okay. All right. Well, let's let's uh, kind of keep keep plowing around here. So, um, huh? Okay. Just making sure. This is our first rodeo in the adventures of streaming with Doctor McKinney. Oh, okay. Uh, no, it's okay. Well, Zach, you guys can remute somebody if they're making noise. Um. Okay, so uh, so what we've got here right now, I've got two pieces of code. Uh, move the cat 10 steps, wait a second, and then do it a second time. And so if I run that, then it moves, and then you saw that after the wait, uh, the green flag reappeared. Um, so what would be another way to do... Um, uh, to do this, let's say I wanted to have him move 50 steps in 10, 10 step increments. What, uh, how could I modify my code to accomplish that? Don't all jump up at once now. Yeah, you can do a loop. Okay, so I could copy the uh, move and wait command and like do something like this. Yeah, exactly. So I could do something like that, but as you can see, this is kind of ugly code and not really optimal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of this part and I'm just gonna drag it over to the left and it'll disappear. And then I'm gonna use the repeat command and the repeat, uh, yeah, either copy paste. So you can copy paste by uh, right clicking and uh, hitting duplicate. Or what I did just a minute ago was I dragged code to the left to the code bar and it'll just make it disappear. Uh, okay, so now I've got it will repeat the process of moving 10 steps and waiting a second 10 times. Um, and if I execute that, then, as we can see, the cat will start to move and uh, everything is happy. Okay, uh, so great. So the ideas of the different uh, things that we've used before uh, when we were talking about different procedural units, so this is when we folded paper airplanes and a few things like that, is all programming comes down to control. And we have a wait as we've seen, we have the repeat for a specific number of times that we've seen, we have a forever repeat, which will come in handy when we start making video games. Um, and then we have two different um, uh, conditionals, so if then and if then else. We have wait until and we have repeat until. Uh, but basically we've got loops and conditionals. Um, all the other pieces of code that are gonna appear are sorted by you know, what they do. So motion is gonna control where something is on the screen and how it looks. Uh, looks controls like uh, you can make the characters say things with like a text bubble. Um, you can have them switch costumes. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. Um, and you can adjust their size or sort of visual effects. You can also make them temporarily hide or show. And um, you can take the different sprites. And if you have one on top of another, you can say, uh, almost like imagine pieces of paper that are layered on top of each other. You can reorder uh, the order of the layering as you see fit. Um, then under sound, uh, you can make the characters play sounds, uh, or for example, you could also use music. Uh, you can change the pitch and the volume of those sound effects. Um, and, uh, right. Uh, events, 
Um, we'll talk about a lot more of these later, but for now, the event that we're going to use heavily is just the green flag being pressed. Uh, but there are some other ones there, uh, which, like I said, we'll talk about more later. Uh, sensing, we'll also talk about more later. Uh, that is how you can detect, for example, whether or not um, um, whether or not the um, um, the mouse cursor is or the mouse is being clicked, or if the mouse cursor is touching an object or something. Um, and if somebody could do uh, Simon a solid and paste the Discord link into the um, into the, the Twitch chat, that'd be great. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so sensing, we'll talk a lot more about that too. Operators, this is basically going to be most of your math type operations. Um, so addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, um, random numbers, which will be useful. Uh, checking whether or not a number is greater than, less than, or equal to. Uh, Boolean operations, so you've got and, or, and not. Uh, things that have to do with uh, lists of items. Uh, modular arithmetic, rounding, and sort of an advanced uh, math block that gives you trig functions and square roots and basically anything you'd want. Uh, orange is variables. Uh, we won't really need those for right this uh, right now, um, but when we get to video game programming, these things are will handle stuff like how much life you have, or what your score is, or you know things like that. Uh, and then my blocks we'll talk about later. Um, okay, so one thing that I really like about Scratch is that um, it, in a sense, we could ref uh, think of it as an object-oriented language. And what I mean by that is that each sprite has its own code to go with it. So for example, let me create a second sprite and it will uh, launch the sprite picker. It has a bunch of them um, built in. Uh, the cheesy poofs, by the way, were something I added, so they're not built in. Uh, but like, let me take, for example, this dog and I'll put the dog into the, the scene and I'll put the cat up there. If I click on the dog, you notice that the middle part of the screen um, is blank. And that's because the dog has no code associated with it. Whereas if I click on the cat, then the cat had the code that we created before. So if I were to run the program as is, so I'll just hit play, then the cat will move 10 steps and wait a second and repeat that process 10 times, just like it would before. But the dog does absolutely nothing, and that's because there's no code associated with the dog. So um, this is what I mean when I say it's object-oriented, that each object, or in this case each sprite, can have its own set of code that uh, goes with it. Uh, it is possible to have the code from one sprite interact with the code from the other, and we'll talk about that kind of stuff later. Um, then there is also one very special sprite that is the background, namely, to the, uh, to the entire project, and that's called a backdrop. Okay? So uh, by default, it starts out just as a plain white screen, but you also have a bunch of backdrops you can pick from. So let's pick this sort of Mario one. And uh, under the backdrops, I can... Uh, add another backdrop. I can upload my own backdrop. So if you want to get uh, get creative with the art, then you can certainly do that. Um, but the backdrop also gets its own code. Now you'll notice one thing that when you create uh, when you're editing the code for the backdrop, you don't have nearly as many tools as you would uh, for a sprite. Uh, for example, there are no things in the motion category for the backdrop, and that makes sense because the backdrop doesn't move. It's just the background. Um, you can do some things that adjust the looks, but there are far fewer options here uh, than for uh, most of the um, most of the the tabs than there are for an actual sprite. So 
your backdrop is a good place to put sort of general code or things that are going to be more general to the entire program. Um, so for example, um, this is where you could kind of put code that uh, keeps track of like a player score or something like that. Whereas maybe the, uh, the sprite that goes with the player would be uh, where you keep track of the health of the player or whether he has power-ups or something. Um, so you've got uh, a little bit of flexibility as to how you structure your program based on where you put the code. Uh, and you want to be a little careful and thoughtful about it so that it's easy to find what you're looking for, and uh, particularly as your projects grow in complexity. Um, okay, so uh, it is easy to copy and paste code from one sprite to another. So, for example, let me take the, um, um, the code from the cat, and I basically just created a copy of it by right-clicking. Then if I drag that and I drag him to the dog or the backdrop, you see how those are sort of highlighted blue, then dragging it to the dog uh, will make a copy of it for the dog. And then if I go back to the cat, I have an extra copy now because I made a, a duplicate. Then I can delete that um, either by just clicking the whole thing and... Um, uh, moving it off to the edge and that'll just delete that little snippet. Um, another way that you can copy code or more complicated things um, is uh, using the backpack. And uh, basically you can think of this as like a glorified clipboard. Uh, you can take something and um, copy it there. Uh, you could copy an entire sprite if you wanted to. So if you have like Let's say that you have two different projects and you want to merge things together, then you can use your backpack to do that. Um, okay, so now that I've done that, the dog has a copy of the code. And so if I execute it, then, of course, the cat and the dog are both, both going to move. Ten steps, wait a second, repeat another, uh, and repeat that process ten times, and they basically do the same thing. But if I edit the code, so for example, let me change the dog's code to go 20 times, five steps, but wait half a second in between. Uh, then we can see that they'll look different. So the dog moves twice as often, but only half as far. And, um, and the cat moves as before. So what this, uh, what this shows you is that if you take code from one sprite and copy it to another and you change it, each sprite is going to execute its own code, whatever that is. Um, and so uh, just because you have code in one sprite, it doesn't in any way influence the code in the other sprite, um, at least not for now. It'll get more complicated later. Um, Oh, okay, so good question here. What happens when you copy code to the backdrop? The backdrop doesn't have access. So for example, here, our dog and cat code both have code to move. Well, a backdrop can't move. So let me, uh, let me duplicate that, and let's try and drag it to the backdrop. And then let's delete the extra. And then let's go to the backdrop and see what we have. Okay, so you get that, and it copied it as is. Uh, and if we execute it, then basically nothing will happen because move five steps doesn't actually exist for um, that. Okay, can somebody mute? Thank you. Um, yeah, so this, guys, if you have a microphone and speakers, but you're not using headphones, please be careful so we don't end up with double audio. That'd be great. Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah, so it just uh, doesn't actually do anything. Um, and even so, the, the point here is that there are no motion blocks for a backdrop. So, this move block here does basically nothing. Um, yeah. Okay. So, good question there. Um, so, let's see. Where was I? Um, Move these guys back. So, uh, right. So each um, 
each sprite gets its own pieces of code. Uh, all right, now let's take the cat for a moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, double click on the cat. Let's see, where did I put it? Um, oh, here it is. Okay. So if I go up to the left, top left of the screen, uh, in I see the code tab, but then I also see a tab called costumes. So right now I've selected the cat. And I've got costumes. So um, the cat in this uh, the cat in this example uh, has two costumes that come preloaded. One is the cat sort of like that, and the other is the cat looking like that. And if you alternate back and forth between the costumes, you can make it look like the cat's in motion. Um, so if I go back to the code, and then under looks. I'll say next costume, then I can make it look as if the cat is walking, um, sort of an animated kind of thing. Uh, and the dog, if we look at his costumes, the dog has uh, three costumes that it comes with, two of which are kind of walking, and then the other is kind of like a confused dog or something like that. So if we go back to the code there and add the next costume, and let's drag these guys back to the left, click there, and then we can see um, then they're kind of animating. Um, you can also switch to a specific costume by name. So um, let me move the next costume out and let's put that back there. And then I could say switch to costume. Uh, so for example, I could do, um, I could say switch, switch to costume A and um, then, uh, so what will happen there is it will continually switch between costume A and costume A. Uh, but then when the program's over, it would at the end switch to, um, oops, uh, switch to the sort of confused looking dog. Like that, um, and we can uh, we could modify this to make it so that it alternates between the first two costumes and then at the end changes to the third. You can have as many costumes as you want, basically for any given sprite. Um, you can create your own, and um, uh, you can edit these. So uh, you can uh, under costumes, if you click there, choose a costume. You can pick one from built in. You can paint. Surprise gives you random, you can upload, and you can also use the camera on your screen, which probably isn't going to be super relevant for, for this. Um, okay, so let's go back to the code. Oh, and similar to costumes, you also have sounds. So um, if I go back to the code, um, the dog has a sound built in, which is just a silly little bark. Um, and if I go to sounds, then I can say play sound or start sound. The difference between these is that if I use play sound until done, uh, whatever happens right after that will not execute until the sound has finished playing. Uh, whereas start sound will start playing the sound and immediately move on to the next uh, piece of code. So let me put this in there, and then we can see that the dog and the cat are going to do their thing. Okay, so as you can imagine, that gets a little annoying. Um, did you guys hear the, the barking okay, by the way? You did not hear a bark. Okay, uh, let me make sure that I have... Uh, I may need to... Let's see, system preferences... Output. Oh, that would be why. Um,
Oh, sorry. Uh, no, we're in the cat sprite. Um, so you can tell which sprite you're in based... Yeah, yeah. But on this one, I switched to a specific name of a costume. Yeah. So, no, that's, that's actually a good point because it is sometimes annoying to realize which costume or which sprite you're in. And the little icon at the top right or whoever's highlighted here... Uh, can can make that a little easier. So okay, so I just changed its next costume and did we get the barking? Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, yeah, this is my bad. I just uh, had the wrong system settings for the uh, output. Uh, okay, great. And everybody is like, woohoo, the bark in the stream. Um, okay, so, uh, right, now under backdrops, if you click on a backdrop, then what was the costume tab becomes the backdrops tab, and everything works exactly the same. You can have as many backdrops as you want, and you can switch backdrop from one to another um, as you wish. Um, so, for example, if I want to just choose another backdrop, and let's say I'll pick this one. Uh, then I could do something like under the dog, under his code, uh, I can just do, for example, next backdrop. And now this is going to be a little trippy. Okay, so that's a little ridiculous, and I wouldn't necessarily ever want to do that in practice, but uh, like that quickly, but uh, you can use the different backdrops for. Uh, for different things. So let's say, for example, we want to make a game uh, that has like different levels in it. Well, uh, maybe the first level is in space and the second level is on a planet and the third level is in the city or something like that. Uh, then you can make the backdrops uh, be for sort of that that kind of effect uh, to set the set the scene for what uh, what you want to do. Um, Okay, so uh, essentially the, um, let's see, we got a question. What would the code look like if we wanted the dog to bark and then, then begin the walking uh, with using both the costumes and end on the silly look? Yeah, please don't do that. Uh, okay, so this would be, let's uh, take the dog and um, just for our sanity, let me get rid of the, the um get rid of the barking uh can somebody mute whoever that is okay oh god and maybe change their name too while you're at it um okay so let's see where was i uh chrome so uh, if I wanted the code to be so that it uh, ends on the silly look, but alternates back and forth between the two walking looks, then I might have to do something like this. So for example, um, I'm going to make a variable, and uh, I'll call this counter. And... Uh, when the program starts, I'm going to set the counters variable to zero. And then I'm going to, um, every time I re repeat the loop, I'm going to move five seconds, or move five steps, and add one to my counter and wait the half second. And then for the costume part, what I'm going to do is under looks, I want to do next costume, but basically I want it to work so that it only ever switches between A and B. And so for that, what I could do is under control, I'll do an if then else. And so I'll say, um, if uh, something, then do one thing, otherwise do something else. Okay, so what I want to do is basically the counter is going to start at zero, and it's going to go up by one every time I do the loop. 
So if I made it so that on even numbers, I use costume A, and on odd numbers, I use costume B, that gives me a basis for a decision here. So I just need to say, all right, how can I tell whether or not a number is odd or even? Um, and a very easy way to do that is to use what's called the mod command. So uh, if I take the mod command and I'm going to use an equal block, so I'll drag those down, and under the variables, I want the counter. So I want counter. So basically what I did was I dragged the counter and plopped it into the little circle. And then I'm going to put counter mod 2. So what mod means here, um, and we've kind of talked about this before when we were talking about the clock arithmetic, counter mod 2 says what is the division or what is the remainder uh, if you divide counter by the number 2? So if you have a number, um, then what is the possible remainder when you divide an integer by 2? Well, it's either 0 or 1. You would never have a remainder of 2 because that means that you could divide another time. Um, so you only ever get 0 or 1. Okay, so... If, and then I'm going to take this block here that computes the division with remainder, and I'm going to plop him into the little circle to make this big diamond. So what this will do is say, uh, compute the counter mod 2. Is it equal to 0? That's either true or false. And anything that's sort of in this pointy diamond looking thing uh, is a true or false only object which is exactly what we need for a conditional. So if pointy thing true, do the first part. If pointy thing false, do the other part. So I'm going to take him, the diamond, and plop him into the little diamond socket. Okay. And then what do I want to do if the statement is true? If I have an even number? Well, I say switch costume to costume A. And otherwise... I've got an odd number, I could switch to costume B. Okay, so uh, let's, um, let's look at that and see how that works. Uh, and one nice thing is pay attention to the counter up here. So um, I'll go ahead and run this. Okay, so the counter is going from zero up to whatever. Oops, sorry, I'm in the cat's code. Uh, and then um, uh, we're moving and changing the counter and waiting half a second and then changing the costume to, uh, if we're on an even number count, to the A costume and an odd number count to the B costume. Okay, so now there's one thing that you guys probably noticed. What costume does the dog start on? So let me... He started on the silly costume, correct? So what I want to do is then on this, I'll say start him on costume B, and then... Uh, Every time it runs, that way it'll alternate back and forth from one to the other. Uh, I started on dog two, yes, and the reason I did that is because what did I set my start my counter on? I started it on zero, and so if I wanted to have it start the other way, I would maybe change it like this change it to start on A, but start the counter on one, an odd number. Um, okay, so let's see how that looks. Okay, look pretty good. Um, and this way, by adding, sorry, by adding this switch costume back to the very beginning for the dog, I make it so that when you start the program, he doesn't start with the um, um, 
he doesn't start with the, the silly look. Okay, so good question, uh, Mr. Rector. Uh, any other questions or ideas so far for how we could uh, make this a little fancier? Either in uh, Discord or in the text, the text chat. Uh, can they jump? So, um, so yes, I could add in a new sprite uh, to make it so that the dog is like surprised by something. Jumping um, is actually basically just motion. So, uh, jumping actually would be complicated to program, and we can we can talk about that more uh, later. Um, but basically, what you would do for jumping is you would have for example, when I hit the space bar or click on it or something like that, then uh, have sort of programmed in uh, jump mechanics. And under motion, the way I would probably use that is actually with setting X and Y or changing X and Y coordinates um, to, uh, and if I wanted the jump to look sort of realistic, so uh, you know, if you, if you jump up in the air, then what kind of motion, uh, describes or what, how do you describe that motion that you make when you jump or if you toss a ball or something? Anybody? Bueller. Well, it'd be vertical. Okay. But it, yeah, it'd be some sort of arc possibly. It could be an arc that goes up and then straight back down, or if it's like throwing a ball, for example, it would be basically a parabolic arc. So what we would have to do to get jumping kind of motion is is basically program in gravity and uh, some stuff like that to simulate uh, the, the math that would uh, describe uh, parabolic motion. Um, as you can imagine, that's a little bit more complicated than I wanted to get to just today, uh, but that gets the, the idea. So um, you can do anything, and some of the ideas you guys said, like opening a door or something like that. So let's take, for example, the door idea. Um, let me go ahead and just create a sprite uh, of some sort. So like, let's say... Um, uh, what would be a good one? Oh, how about the heart candy? That looks fun. Okay, so I could make it so that when the dog touches the heart candy, something special happens. Um, and we'll talk more about how the um, um, how to do some of that sort of next time. But all right, so the question is, what do you get to click to get all the sprites again? So if you're here in the bottom right hand corner, you've got the sprites window. You click. Uh, right there where it says choose a sprite and if you just click that button then it will um, pop open the selector thing uh, so if you click that then you'll get these are all of the sprites that are built into scratch and there's quite a few of them obviously uh, but then also any sprite that you create yourself so for example I uploaded the cheesy poofs bowl at one point um, or the fortune cookie, uh, I was making a silly game. Uh, anything that you've uploaded, you would also see here. Um, you've got lots of animals, characters, toys, things like that. You also have sprites for letters and numbers in a couple of different fonts, uh, which can be kind of useful. Um, yeah. So, um, okay. So let me quit, um, or cancel out of there. So what we'll do next time is talk about how to like do things where the sprites start touching each other and, and make it so that, for example, when the dog gets to the end um, and touches the um, uh, thing, um, then something happens. So let's see. So question, a couple of questions. Uh, one, would making the wait 0.5 seconds occur if I made that faster? Um, could I make the animation look smoother? Yeah, if I wanted it to look smoother, then I would want to change 
for example, this um, uh, to something a little bit more uh, quick, and so I can kind of get the animation to be less jerky. Um, there's a couple other ways to do that. So for a fixed animation like this, um, then, um, uh, you know, I can, I can speed it up like that. There's uh, for motion of other kinds, like particularly when we start programming a video game, uh, then uh, we'll definitely want to have more responsive kind of graphics. And we'll talk about some better ways to do that as we go on. Um, okay, so uh, I'll go ahead and save the project. And then I wanted to go back to just the Scratch main page and uh, show you two things. So if you go to Explore, you can find all kinds of other, um, other people's projects. So for example, here, this one's kind of interesting, Coronavirus Simulator. And this is something we'll actually program um, ourselves. Um, so here, there's all kinds of evil viruses and I have to stay away from them and it's going to get a lot harder. Oop, and I can get a goggles and maybe a mask and hand sanitizer or something. So my point though, is that you can go and find a whole lot of, um, different, uh, different projects that people have shared. Uh, the other really neat thing is that if you, for anything that's shared publicly, if you hit see inside, you can look inside and see all of the code that that uh, project took. Um, and uh, so all of this stuff, this is what y'all's video games are going to look like when we get to that point. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool is if you click up here on tutorials, then... Um, Scratch has a whole bunch of different tutorials pre-programmed in to kind of walk you through how to do something. So, um, so I'd suggest say start with the getting started one, and then you can do like code a cartoon and create animations that talk and things like that to kind of get a sense for for some of the basics. Um, then there's all sorts of uh, like little specific stuff like how do you make a clicker game or a pong game or how do you use the arrow keys or use sounds? Um, okay, so let's see the question is, how does the system know what to do when the program's all over the place like that? That's actually kind of a complicated question. So um, it's not as if all of that code is running independently. It seems to you as the end user that each sprite is like a complete different entity and it's all running uh, completely separately. That's not actually how it works in practice. Um, I don't know how exactly Scratch on the back end does it. I've got a couple of ideas for how it would. Um, this is one of the downsides of object-oriented programming, or maybe better put, parallel programming, is when you think you have two things running in parallel, doesn't mean that's necessarily exactly how they're running. Um, when we talk about messaging, uh, I can kind of give you a sense for uh, what really is happening on the inside, um, uh, or at least a way to explain it. Um, and we'll talk about that sort of stuff later. Um, okay. So, uh, I think we're, it's almost four o'clock. So let's, uh, let's, we'll quit here in a second. Um, for now, what I need you guys to do is to get on, uh, scratch, make sure that you've created a scratch account linked it to your email address, verified that email address, um, because as a security feature, you can't publicly share anything unless you have a valid email address linked to your account. Um, and the only way that I'm going to be able to see your projects is if you share them with me. So um, uh, so get, get that done and uh, start to poke around with a couple of these uh, tutorials and just kind of experiment around with things and get a sense for uh, what, uh, what all you have at your disposal here. And then on Wednesday, um, we'll keep going, with, um, uh, keep going with sort of adding things to our um, um, uh, 
to our project. Okay, so question in the chat is, can I ask a question related to class but not about the lecture? Absolutely. Um, this is our first time really to all get together. Um, so if you guys have general questions about uh, the class structure, obviously we're going to have to change a few things because of the whole nobody being on campus thing. Um, so yeah, if you've got general questions, let's go ahead and try and dispense or handle any of those now that you have. And of course, if you have others, you can always find me in the office, which will be on Discord uh, or, you know, obviously email. All right. So Mr. Versace, go for it. Uh, very good question. Yeah, the BFC thing is going to be kind of complicated. Um, I'm not sure yet. Uh, if anything, we would have to do it in a more electronic manner. I could probably program it in through Canvas instead of you guys doing it on paper. Um, so, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out. And, and Reese, I know since you're also in calculus, we've got the same problem there. And uh, we are kicking around some ideas, but haven't come to a decision yet. Um, uh, so stay tuned on, on that. And that also goes for the final. I mean, hopefully it'll be the case that we'll all be back on campus by May, but who the heck knows? Um, there's a lot of uncertainty right now with this whole situation. Um, okay, so Mike, you asked, um, did I record the video? Yes. So two, two ways you can get to the video. Um, one, Twitch will save these uh, screen captures for uh, 14 days, but immediately after I conclude the stream, I'm going to uh, take the recording from Twitch and upload it to YouTube, to the math, uh, math department's YouTube page, um, and I'll post a link to that on Canvas um, so that you can get to the recordings in perpetuity and they won't expire after uh, 14 days. Uh, so yeah, they will all be recorded. You guys can go back and rewatch things uh, as necessary. Um, hopefully this will be kind of useful. Uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, any other questions? So uh, the question about the BSC, I'll get back to you guys and recording. Everything will be on YouTube um, after it's uh, after the stream is done. Um, anything else? Paste in the Twitch chat, s'il vous plaît. Yes, yes. G keep uh, keep up with the assignments that are on Canvas basically as planned. Um, so, um, yeah. And obviously if you have questions, let us know. Um, the other thing that, uh, we still need to kind of work out is, uh, TA hours. Um, the guys, uh, I mean, they're on the stream now and they're also in discord. Um, we'll use discord basically like as a virtual office, um, and there's some, uh, discord has a pretty cool way that you guys can share your screens with each other. So for example, if you've got a question about something, then you can share the screen and I can see what you're looking at and what your, you know, what exactly your code is, et cetera. Um, it'll take us a little bit of time to kind of get used to this new regime. Um, basically just stay flexible. Um, okay. Yeah. Also good question. What do my office hours look like? Um, basically I'm going to be on Twitter. I mean, uh, um, uh, discord whenever I'm not teaching. Uh, and I'll basically, if you've got a question, just go ahead and ask it in the text. And, um, then I'll get to it when I get back. Uh, if I'm online and actually free, then I'll be in one of the voice channels, uh, the voice channel I called office and you can just join that one, and that way you'll know that I'm on audio. If I'm not in front of the computer or I'm busy with something, then I'll put myself in the AFK channel so you'll know that I'm not actually in the keyboard. So kind of think about that, like whether or not my door is open uh, in, the, in the regular office. Um, 
Okay. So, uh, and the other thing I should say with respect to office hours um, is um, for the next few days, I imagine I'm going to be pretty, uh, well, let's just say that some of my colleagues, some of your other professors are not as um, technologically adept as the rest of us. Um, yeah. And in, in terms of when I expect to be on, uh, it's pretty much eight to five, eight to four. Um, I have class at eight o'clock, 11 o'clock, and then obviously this class. So during calculus, you know, don't count on me uh, being online uh, when I'm teaching the calculus class. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So good, good questions. Uh, I'll update the Canvas page with some of this new information, links to things. Um, and that should be should be good. Uh, okay, well, if there are no other questions, I'll go ahead and uh, stop the stream. And uh, you can go ahead and find me in Discord. And I'll get the recording up to YouTube ASAP. So thanks for coming. And I'll see you guys Wednesday, if not sooner.